good morning. I want to welcome you this morning to Bond Baptist Church. And if you have your Bible this morning, you can flip over to Luke 5 1. Luke 5 1. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you this morning, uh, there's a Bible in front of you you can use. And if you don't own a Bible, that Bible is yours to take home. So uh, you're welcome to that. But Luke 5, 1, we'll read through verse 11. It says, uh, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked to put out a little way from, shore, from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and the nets were breaking. And they signaled to the partners in the other boats to come and help them and they came and filled both the boats so that it began to sink but when Simon Peter saw it he fell down at Jesus' knees saying depart from me for I am a sinful man O Lord for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish that they had taken and so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And they brought their boats to land and left everything and followed him. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we, uh, we love you this morning. God, we thank you for our resurrected King. God, we thank you that he's still resurrecting us and bringing new life to our bodies. God, we ask that you would begin to move in our hearts and in our minds this morning, God, that you would stir us to move, God, that you would stir us to follow you. God, we need you in this place. I need you to touch my tongue and to give me wisdom to speak your words, Father. Hide me behind the cross. Lord, we love you this morning. And it's in the name of our resurrected King, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to start out with a question this morning. and um, I know that a lot of us in the house this morning are Christians. And um, I want to ask this question anyway. Um, what does following Jesus look like for you? What, do, what does following Jesus look like for you? Uh, another way to put it is, what does following Jesus mean to you? What, what does following Jesus mean to you? And I mean uh, not in a, a, a very spiritual sense, but in a practical sense, what kind of impact does following Jesus have on your everyday life? Does following Jesus affect the way you do Monday through Friday? What does following Jesus mean to you? What does it mean for your life? How does it impact your life? How does it change you, who you are? How does following Jesus affect your life? What does following Jesus mean to you? And the reason that I ask this question this morning is, is that I believe many people in this house this morning, we, we want to follow Jesus. We desire to follow Jesus. It's, uh, there, I don't have to stand up here and persuade you to start following Jesus, but the gap that we often have in our life is that we want to follow Jesus, we want to follow Jesus, but we're not sure what it looks like practically. We're not sure what following Jesus 
looks like on Monday. We know that uh, following Jesus leads you to church on Sunday mornings, but for many of us, we know that there's more to it than that. We feel like there is something more than to just come to church, and there is. But for many of us, we don't know what that next step is. Have you ever felt that? What, what, if, if I'm following Jesus, where is he taking me? And the reason that I ask it specifically for you is because we're all following the same Jesus, but he's not leading us to the same places. He's not leading us on the same path. Okay? Now let me make this clear. Following Jesus for you may not look like following Jesus for me. Stay with me. Let me show you. God may lead me to move to Thailand and start a church. He may. He's not right now. Don't worry. But he may lead you to stay in Anvil your entire life and be faithful to your wife and your kids and your job. Both people can be following Jesus. But following Jesus for one person may look far different than following Jesus for another person. So what does following Jesus look like for you? What does it look like for you? Because it's not a formula. You, you don't just... Uh, there's not some kind of magic list that we give you when you would get saved and say you've got to do these 10 things or these 20 things and if you do these things, it's a telltale sign that you're following Jesus. Because that's not how a relationship works. That's how religion works. You can do these things and be religious, but a, a relationship with Jesus is organic. It doesn't always look the same for every single person. And sure, there's going to be indicators and there's going to be signs. But following Jesus for every single person is not the same. It looks different for some people. And so, what does it look like for me? What does following Jesus in my everyday, ordinary life, what does that look like for me? It, it, following Jesus looks different and, and as long as you're following Jesus there is no wrong way I'm not saying that um, there's many ways to heaven I'm not saying any of that I'm talking about when you come into a relationship with Jesus when you surrender your life to Him what does it look like after that? what happens then? because many of us we've got that far right? Many of us in this house, we have got to the place where we said, Yes, Jesus, I want to follow you, but we haven't found out what's next. So what does it look like? Sometimes we fall into this trap where we think that, that the person who has uh, moved to Uganda to start an orphanage is following Jesus more or following Jesus better or is more spiritual than somebody who may simply work at a job and be faithful to their family and support the local church. Have you ever felt like that? Yeah. Yeah. That because I'm not m moving to a far country to try to win lost people, I'm not as spiritual or I'm not following Jesus like those people are. You felt this, right? Jesus may lead me, and I hope he does. I hope this is his plan for my life. I hope he leads me to pastor this church for the next 35 years, and then he gives me uh, the opportunity to retire into Florida. That's what I... That's what, my hopes and my dreams are for my life right now. But in reality, he may lead me to go somewhere else. He may lead me to uh, move to Europe to, to disciple people. I don't know. But what I want you to realize this morning is that because Jesus has led you into Anvil, Kentucky, in this season of your life, you're not less spiritual than other people who have moved away to follow Jesus. 
What I want to make clear this morning is that following Jesus is not safe. That's not what the impression I want to give off to you this morning. Because when you decide to follow Jesus, your whole life becomes unsafe. Your finances become unsafe. Your relationships become unsafe. Your career becomes unsafe. Even your physical body can become unsafe. Just ask the disciples. All but one of them was martyred for the faith. So I don't want you to fall into the trap of safe Christianity this morning. But what I do want you to realize is that you don't have to do something extravagant to be a good follower of Jesus. See, oftentimes, Jesus calls us into ordinary circumstances to do extraordinary things. Into ordinary circumstances, everyday, average life. But He calls us in those circumstances to do some extraordinary things. I, I feel sometimes like they're... And, and there's been seasons of my life where I felt this, and chances are you have too, where there is a tension between me living my life and me following Jesus. So I would like to just continue on with my job, but I have to follow Jesus, so I have to leave everything. Or I would like to spend quality time with my family, but instead I have to follow Jesus. Or I, I want to have a hobby or a career, but I can't because I have to follow Jesus. We feel guilty sometimes because uh, we're living life. Have you ever felt this way? I mean, I just, uh, I'm just talking to myself this morning, I guess. But Jesus calls us into the familiar to do unfamiliar things. He may not be calling you to China to work in the underground church, but I bet that He is calling you to be faithful where you are, to love the people you're around, and to support the local church. And don't get me wrong this morning, man, I'm praying that one day we're going to be sending missionaries to every country in the world and to every state in this nation and that we're going to have huge impact around the world. But right now, chances are, God's not calling you to the Amazon rainforest. So if He's not calling you to the Amazon rainforest and He's not calling you to the underground church in China, what is He calling you to? Where we pick up in our story today, Jesus has walked up into an ordinary situation, okay? He's began his public ministry, he started healing people, and he has a large crowd following him. But he hasn't chosen his 12 disciples yet. He hasn't chosen the 12 closest friends. And he's walking around uh, this sea and... He begins teaching the people and the crowd begins pushing in on him and he really doesn't have anywhere to go. So he sees uh, Simon who we know is Peter and he's cleaning his nets. And what this means is in this time when they went fishing they would go at night time when the fish would be close to the surface and they would be in big schools and they would go out in the middle of this ocean and they would throw nets into these schools of fish and then they would pull them back in. They would do this all night and then at the end of the night they would bring all the fish in and then they would have to hang their nets up and clean the beer bottles and Walmart bags out of them. They'd have to get all the trash out. It was probably just seaweed but uh, you got to have an imagination. And... So they would clean and wash all of their nets. And when Jesus walks up on Simon and his buddies, that's what they were doing. They'd worked all night and they hadn't got anything. I'm sure they were frustrated. and I'm having to clean these nets and I didn't even catch anything. And I'm sure they were frustrated with their situation. I'm sure they were aggravated. And Jesus, best we can tell, he kind of just jumps in the boat with them. He just jumps in. He says, hey, can I borrow your boat? (laughs) 
need to borrow your boat for a few minutes. I don't know what you tell people when they just jump in your boat. I guess you tell them, all right, let's go. But Jesus goes with Peter a little bit out of the uh, shoreline there, and he sits down in the boat, and he begins to teach the people. And uh, I don't know how long he taught. I'm sure he was probably a long-winded preacher too. Uh, but he taught, and when he got done, he, he said, Simon, Let's push out a little farther and see if we can catch any fish. That doesn't sound very weird to us, but Simon was a fisherman. He'd been fishing all his life, and he knew you can't catch fish during the day. This was the middle of the day by now, and you can't catch fish in the middle of the day. That's not when you go fishing. And so here Jesus is, he's a carpenter and he's jumped into Peter's boat and, and is telling Peter, who is the fisherman, how to fish. And I'm sure Peter's thinking, who is this guy? Who is this dude? I'm sure he can make a great rocking chair, but he don't know how to fish. It's not fishing time. Jesus, if you want to go fishing, we can go fishing later. You can help us pull the nets in. But now is not the time to go fishing. This is crazy, Jesus. You're wasting our time. And besides that, he had already washed his nets. He didn't want to get his nets dirty again because he didn't have to want to have to wash his nets again. But Jesus says, let's go out here and see if we can catch any fish. And Peter agrees to it, and I'm not really sure why. I don't know if he was just compelled by Jesus or if he wanted to prove Jesus wrong, or I don't know why he went with Jesus, but he may have just been curious. But he, he says, all right, let's go out, and we'll try to catch some fish. And then one of the most amazing things happens. In the middle of the day, when you're not supposed to catch fish, in the middle of the day, when it's not fishing time, they throw those nets out, and fish begin to appear in the nets. Not just like a few fish. So many fish that the nets begin to tear. And I wonder what Peter was thinking. This is not supposed to happen and this is not how I imagine this to go. The fish were not even biting because they had worked all night and hadn't caught anything. But the nets began to fill up and there were so many that fish that they had to call other boats in to get all these fish. And they pull them in and if I was Peter, I probably would have uh, been walking around bragging, yeah, I caught all them fish. Did you see, go down there and see how many fish are in my boat. Just go down there and look. Just go down there and look, Peter. Go down there and look, James and John. Go look and see how many fish are in my boat. But Peter does something far different. When Peter realizes that the impossible has just happened, he falls at Jesus' feet and he says, Lord, I know I'm sinful. Please, go away from me. And Jesus says to him, he says, Actually, Peter, from now on, you're going to be fishing for men. And then, when they get the boat in, they just leave everything. It doesn't even say that they done something with the fish. It says that when the, the boat hit land, they jumped off and walked away. And you would have to. If this man just done the impossible, he brought in more fish than you would have in a year, you would have to. But what does this have to do with us? It's a great story, but what does it have to do with us? Why does this matter to me? On this particular day, 
Jesus walked into Peter's situation. He walked in. Peter was a professional fisherman. He walked in to where Peter was working at. He invaded his ordinary life. And allowed Peter to do some extraordinary things. Peter was probably a good fisherman. But he wasn't nearly this good. There's no way that he could have done this on his own. But when Jesus came into Peter's life in this moment. He allowed him to do some amazing things. And here's why. Here's why I think Jesus let this all go down the way it did. On this particular day, on this particular moment, Peter may have just been the the most successful fisherman in the world. No doubt he was the most successful fisherman in this small town. And what I want you to realize this morning is that this was really the height of Peter's career. It was the big moment. It was the moment that he had been waiting for his whole life and he just walks away. But Jesus gave Peter success so that Peter would have a platform in that community. Because everybody wanted to talk to Peter now. He was the talk of the town. Everybody wanted to meet Peter. Did you hear about that guy who caught two boatloads of fish in the middle of the day? Have you heard about that guy named Peter? Peter all of a sudden had influence. Because here's what's true. Success equals influence. Success equals influence. Let me show you. If you're in a job and you're terrible at it, nobody wants to know how you do it. But if you become an innovator, if you succeed in your field, if you become the best of the best in your field, everybody wants to know how you do it. With success, there comes influence. Success equals influence. And so Jesus gave Peter success so that he would have influence in his community. And when, G- when Peter walked away from this successful fishing business to follow Jesus, everyone would have gasped. Said there must be something to that if Peter would walk away. If Peter would walk away after catching uh, a year's worth of fish, there must be something to this man. Jesus asks us to do familiar things in unfamiliar ways. He wants you to go into the place where you work, the place where you have influence. And He wants you to be the best that you can be for His glory. Everybody has a thing, okay? And Peter's thing was fishing. Your thing may be a hobby, it may be a career, it may be a job. Whatever your thing is, your, your, your niche, the thing that you're good at. God wants to leverage that to make an impact in our community. Whatever your thing is, you are better at something than everybody else. You are a 10 at something. And God wants to use that area of your life to bring Him glory. Maybe you're a doctor or a lawyer or you work in a trade. Whatever it is, Jesus wants to make you a different kind of whatever you are. 
See, Jesus didn't call Peter out of fishing. He called him to be a different kind of fisherman. A better kind of fisherman. And so he's not calling you to be something that you're not. He's just calling you to be a better version of yourself. So that he can get glory. If you're a doctor, be the best doctor in your field. If you're a lawyer, be the best lawyer in the firm. If you're a contractor, do the best you can so that you'll have influence with the people in your field. If you're a teacher, be the best teacher that you can be so that you'll have influence with the kids and so that you'll have influence with the other teachers and you'll have influence with the parents. Jesus calls us to do ordinary things. In extraordinary ways. He wants you to go and be the best you can be. And when you find success, He wants you to point it back to Him. And say, the only reason that I caught two boats full of fish is because Jesus was in the boat. And the only reason that that I was able to get where I am is because Jesus was with me. And when I get where I'm going, I'm going to point to Jesus. And say, the only reason I got this far is because Jesus was in the boat. When you find success, you find influence. And when you have influence, you can make an eternal difference. So, whatever it is you do, be the best. What it it requires of us today is that we take a look at our careers and we take a look at our hobbies and our families and say, how can I use these things? How can I use my influence in these areas of my life to share Christ with people? What influence do I have and how can I leverage that influence for the kingdom of heaven? What is in my hand? What has God given me in this season of my life that I can leverage to make a difference? Because sure, you, you might be successful without Jesus. You might um, go far without Jesus. You might do some great things without Jesus. But what will it even matter? If you make all the money and you win all the awards at the end of your life, if you've not influenced anybody what will it matter what have you got and how can you use it for the kingdom of heaven many of us we look at work and and we think that work is a punishment we think that work is is burdensome and we think that work is uh, dragging us down and the only reason that we're at work is to make money You ever been there? Don't you lie to me. Sometimes you go to work and the only reason you are there because you don't have any days to take off. Right? But if we will stop looking at work like that and if we will see it as a place where we can go and love and serve people and make a difference, it will change our lives. Work is not just work. Work is a mission field that we as Christians are to invade. And so, for you today, following Jesus might not be that you go to Asia and start an orphanage. It may mean that you show up at work Monday morning and you love and serve the people who you work with. It might not look for you like uh, moving to South America to do something for God. It may look like you loving your kids, spending time with your kids, raising champions for Christ. For you, it may just be being faithful where you are, influencing the people who are around you, and loving those people so that they would know and love Christ. Just like Jesus called Peter to be a different kind of fisherman, 
He calls us to be different kinds of doctors and lawyers and students and teachers. He calls us to be different kinds of electricians, secretaries, moms, dads, grandparents. Whatever it is in your life, He calls you to be a different kind of people. To make an impact. And here's what people will see. When you go and you go into the everyday and the ordinary with this kind of attitude, they'll see that you're not there for money. We should never be a people that are purely motivated by money or by success. But we ought to be motivated for our, by our love for one another and our desire to see people come into a growing relationship with Christ. Sure, you might get paid when you show up, but your goal should not be a paycheck. Your goal should be to love and serve those people. You have influence. How are you going to use it? Will you use it to see people come into a growing relationship with Christ? Or will you leverage it for yourself? We should be driven in our workplaces not so that we could reach the highest rung of the ladder, but so that we can see the most people come to Christ. Jesus calls you and I this morning to follow Him into our homes and into our workplaces, into our families. He's calling you and I to love and serve the people around us. He calls you and I to be beacons of hope and light and love to the people around us. So, I'm about to close. And I want to ask you this one question. The praise team is going to come and they're going to uh, get ready to sing. But let me ask you this one question. And then we'll pray. In light of what you've heard today, what does it mean for you to follow Jesus? What does it mean for you to follow Jesus? Let's pray together. God, we uh, come to you today and Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for this moment that we share together. And God, uh, we pray as a people, God, that we could walk into the ordinary circumstances in our life and that we wouldn't be frustrated and we wouldn't, we wouldn't be mad that we were there. Lord, that we wouldn't feel less than other people who are following Jesus, but God, that we would realize that you have us there by divine design. God, that you have us there for a purpose. And God, I pray that we wouldn't waste time in our life by failing to see that you have a purpose for us where we are. God, I pray that you'd make us influencers. God, I pray that you'd make us world changers. God, help us to love and serve the people that you've been around, put us around. God, help us to be the light of the world. God, help us to be the men and women that you've called us to be. God, we love you so much. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning the altar is going to be open. And uh, before we open the altar, I just want to tell you that, that Jesus loves you this morning. He wants you to follow Him. He, he don't want a list of rules or regulations, but, but He wants a relationship with you, a real authentic relationship. And if you're interested in that this morning or if you need to pray, I would love to pray with you this morning. The altar's open.